three, two, one. So hi everyone. Thank you very much for tuning in. So today we will discuss the essay, The Missing Link. It's from 1973 and it appeared in Philosophy Who Needs It. And it's crazy how many concepts and issues are discussed here from the nature of tribalism to an evolutionary hypothesis and even a critique to the anarchists of the right. So discussing this, uh, we have Don Watkins and James Valiant. Uh, they have uh, deep knowledge on, on the issue and on objectivism. Uh, Don has co-authored several books, uh, such as Equal is Unfair and The Moral Case for Finance that I have here. Uh, and he's running a uh, website called donswriting.com, where you can find some of his courses uh, dealing with objective communi communication and more. And James Valiant is the author of The Passion of Ayn Rand's Critics and also Creating Christ. And uh, both um, have deep knowledge on objectivism. So I was wondering if we could go to the start of the essay, but first of all, uh, I will start with a small advertising to the uh, Ayn Rand Center UK. Uh, so every Saturday we meet, meet each other and to discuss lectures of Leonard Pickoff. And last uh, Saturday, uh, we discussed the art of thinking and specifically the part of thinking in essentials. So I was thinking if Don and James could give us a brief statement of the essence of this essay and what it means. Uh, to pick up on your connection just right there, you'll for those who were participating on Saturday, Leonard Peikoff did an amazing, elegant, simple reduction of the importance of philosophy and then the essence of objectivism itself what is the you know definitional almost uh, essence of objectivism and in that uh, discussion you know there's so many amazing insights that Ayn Rand has in politics and ethics and aesthetics he reduced it to her theory of concepts literally he said that is the single most essential aspect that's how Ayn Rand understood it herself and here you can really see it the entire essay is in fact devoted to a form of the anti-conceptual mentality <clears throat> The theme here is, in effect, that collectivism, whether psychological, ethical, aesthetic, political, is grounded in a certain psychoepistemology, in a certain fallacious approach to thinking methods itself, how you think about things. And it's grounded in a psychoepistemology that is concrete bound, rooted in the perceptual, and refuses to elevate beyond first order abstractions. And so she gives a number of examples in the course of uh, this essay about how that is so, how it is that groupthink, how the collectivist mentality is really a psychoepistemological phenomenon of a mind arrested at the perceptual level. Yeah, I mean, I would just put it a little bit more simply um, that this is what happens when people don't think. <laughs> she's She's tracing the kind of consequences that happen when they default on the responsibility of thinking. And I think Jim got at some of the major elements of what she sees as the causes and consequences of that. A much more elegant, simple way of putting it, Don. <laughs> well, the elaboration is important. So. Um, and before we start to go into the, the essay, I think um, I was wondering if you can help me in clarifying the concept of anti-conceptual mentality. And particularly, I think it would, for me, it would be useful to take a look at, to take a look at it in a genus uh, differentia uh, difference. And, and I think the genus would be um, psychopistemology if, I, if I'm thinking correctly, but the differentia is a little bit difficult for me. Uh, it sh surely, as, as you have just said, Don, it's thinking or not thinking, probably. But for instance, if that is not also 
like people who think rationalistically fall into this category or is is it something more specific um no the way that she'll often put it is concrete bound or percept sometimes she'll call it a perceptual mentality and so if you look at um introduction to objectivist epistemology she has this section where she's talking about she's going to talk about abstractions from abstractions so she says like the starting point of human knowledge is conceptualizing entities and like perceptual level features of entities entities characteristics like you know red fast th these kinds of things that you can directly perceive and then she says the next step is abstractions from abstractions where we go beyond what we can directly perceive and then ultimately end up with things like philosophic abstractions justice freedom and she makes this point that not everybody does this or at least not everybody does it fully and because you can't, the you can't really screw up at the when you're conceptualizing the perceptual level like everybody like learns what toast is and it's not like a special problem um, to get that but that what can happen is that beyond the perceptual level when you get to abstractions from abstractions people can attempt to take shortcuts and so what they'll do is just take over and imitate and memorize rather than understand they won't actually go through the process of concept formation and so what happens is that those kinds of words at most kind of evoke emotions for them, or it's kind of like going through a ritual where they know it like elicits certain responses from people. They know the context in which it's, you know, okay for us to use the word justice and freedom and so on, but they're not actually concepts. They don't actually stand for grasping certain relationships in reality. And her view is that a person who predominantly is functioning on that kind of level is essentially on the perceptual level. They haven't learned how to speak, as she puts it, I forget, in this essay or some other essay. And so what she's getting is that that's what it means that it's a psychopistemology. It's that their, their habitual way of using their mind is to be at the level of percepts and use what we would have as concepts, what a thinker has as concepts, as in effect floating abstractions. But that's even too nice a way to put them. They're just kind of like, um, they're, they're noises with some chance associations behind them. It's a really good way of putting it. To technically to translate it in your, in your terms, Alejandro, is uh, this is more the empiricist mentality of psychopistemology, the concrete bound mentality. Now, of course, uh, both the empiricist and the rationalist, these are technical terms that are used in objectivism uh, I would refer you to uh, Dr. Peikoff's course and the book Understanding Objectivism for further elaboration, but he goes into the psychological syndromes that are rationalism and empiricism, contrasting them with the objective approach, and it boils down to the objective approach to concepts and how they you, you, you form and use concepts. So if you if anything beyond the immediate perceptual level is not really well understood or integrated by you, or you're not able to reduce them, to the actual perceptual uh, grounding of each of those concepts, then your concepts will be, in effect, floating abstractions to the extent that you utilize them. And in dealing with things, you will be, in fact, concrete bound uh, because your co concepts are not properly integrated. Having an objective approach to concepts is really the only way to use your mind in higher order abstraction from abstractions. What we're talking about here is a psychopistemological syndrome, uh, one associated mostly with what we what well, objectivists call empiricism or the concrete bound mentality, the one unwilling or unable to go beyond those first level uh, concepts, which are almost givens. Okay, thank you. So the essay begins with four examples and for me, one of the things that is extremely uh, um, interesting here is that I think I've read the essay for like four or five times and it's not until like the last time I read it, I, it the, the examples made sense. I couldn't find the common link between them. So what is the common link between all these examples? And... Um, Okay, I, what, what is a common link? And then I, I think I'm going to bring 
one past essay that we have discussed uh, in, the, in the last weeks. Well, I, let me just say that I actually have a very similar experience. Um, I, I remember reading this essay the first time, must have been as a teenager, and I thought, I don't know what she's talking about at all. And then, like, as I sort of started to get a glimpse of what she's talking about, I was like, well, I don't see it in reality. These four examples seem really weird. And even now when I go back to it and I can see, okay, the, the way in which these are examples of the anti-conceptual mentality, it's striking because with the sense that you get and the way she describes it is that these were the four kinds of major examples that went into her conceptualizing this phenomenon. And she kind of describes that first example as her first hint um, the, the first example is of, you know, the businessman who's unwilling to challenge uh, the, the political machine that he's in. And so um, to me, these I, I can see like how Ayn Rand, the genius can see like, oh, this is I'm grasping a new phenomenon here. But I find the examples actually pretty confusing. And it's um, it, it's it's interesting to me that she starts with those because I, I don't know that they actually are helpful to most people. Uh, certainly to me, it was a lot to get that, oh, th there is a common denominator here that you're integrating. Looking back, it's amazing. I mean, it just shows you the nature of her mind that she could look at those and see um, what was essentially similar about them. Yeah, I, that, that's a comment worth uh, exp expanding on. Ayn Rand had this remarkable x-ray vision, you know, back when I was a teenager in the 1970s and first turning on my political awareness of things, if you were to say to someone, well, you know, uh, this aware, this tribalism, this collectivism that's taking hold is really a, a, the phenomenon behind, you know, uh, quotas and this groupthink, this global balkanization, as Ayn Rand called it elsewhere. It's really all basically the same thing. They would laugh. What are you talking about? Of course, are you? What are you? A racist? Or with environmentalism, another issue. If you said, you know, environmentalism is anti-man, anti-mind, anti-life, they would say to you, "What are you in favor of pollution?" No. At the time, Ayn Rand had this amazing X-ray vision where she could really see the trends and the directions by understanding the fundamentals that were going on in her time philosophically. Politically, psychologically, she could put things together in a, a, a remarkable way. So here we are. What is this? Fifty years on, almost forty-eight years on from the way, the time this essay was published, she nails intersectionality. She nails it. It's a total groupthink. It's a question of what tribe or group or even race you belong to, whether you're gay or straight or black or white, is now the obsession, especially on the left. They've replaced Marxist class analysis, in effect, with all these intersectional victim group analysis. Ayn Rand called it 50 years ago, astonishingly. Now, her examples in the first part of the essay, it is true, when I first read it, it's the first section, those four examples, that I had to go back over and over and over before I even wanted to finish the essay to understand what the heck is she talking about? A philosopher that just says, tell us your positions and not why. A novelist who says, keep it prosaic and down to the village level, as opposed to some grand theme. A businessman who refuses to question the politics and the conventional morality of your family. That kind of, what do all these things have in common? It is precisely an anti-conceptual mentality. You know, I hate to use a, another really crude example, but when you're young, when we are all trying uh, in effect to find out who we are as young people, uh, the common experience is you are excluded from a group. You are not cool. It's not, not cool to be X, Y, or Z. And whatever is your group thinks is not cool are those perceptual concretes that will make you belong to the group. So we're trained, it's almost it's a philosophical premise, in effect, that underlies a lot of the way we're raised. And you've got to fit in. You've got to have friends. you got to. And that mentality is the psychology that I think underlies all of this, which underlies the psychoepistemological habits that we get into in not getting up to the conceptual level. It is a refusal to go beyond, to think in causal terms. In the novelist's case, to go up and consider a universal theme, 
in the philosopher's case to consider what that why Ayn Rand's positions might be what they are is more relevant than actually her positions, or the businessman who won't convention who won't question conventional uh, morality about government or uh, his family. <clears throat> Each of them are refusing to go up to a higher level of understanding. Each of them are refusing to understand something else that's going on that they're missing out on, the causes of ideas for the philosopher. What is causing the prosaic events that the novelist is talking about? What is that sense that that businessman is getting? So to me, once I grasp those examples, I, ah, what she's talking about is something mental, psychopistemological. They're not thinking beyond the perceptual level to understand their context. I'm curious, do you have any example uh, of your own that, that could be more graspable about this kind of uh, mentality? In, in, well, as I say, you know, in my own experience, just growing up in high school in Southern California in the 1970s, be cool or be cast out, you know, and that's I, that is part of what is the psychology behind it. And I literally had to stand up, you know, uh, have a declaration of independence in my own mind. I don't care what my peers think. So brave and you, know, you have to have sort of a spine of steel to do that as a teenager. Most people don't have that kind of intellectual confidence, and we do not have a culture that trains that kind of independence, individualism, or respect for reason either. So, I mean, the the interesting thing is it shouldn't be hard to come up with examples because Ayn Rand gives a ton that are very, like, once you conceptualize them under tribalism and see tribalism as an expression of the anti-conceptual mentality, as she like describes it, it's all over the place. Like, like racism, every example of racism you see, or the one I, the one that really resonated with me. Um, it just, if you've ever seen like any, like uh, if you've ever seen the show justified in the second season, you know, you see like this one crime family and the whole orientation of this, you know, Southern town is, um, you know, kin first and uh, like, my family right or wrong and it's not just unjustified this is often kind of a trope and it's something that we encounter in life it's any time that you're seeing sort of in-group out-group dynamics that's this so she distinguishes different versions of the anti-conceptual mentality primarily it's the group version that she's talking about in this essay and then the individual version that we'll talk about in selfishness without a self i think next week or at some point um, but it's uh, anytime you're under, trying to understand these kind of dynamics that we see around us of in-group, out-group, um, that is a manifestation of what she's talking about. And that's why, you know, I said when I first encountered this essay and I started to think I knew what she was talking about, it seemed just kind of this trivial thing. But in reality, it really is everywhere because it's the default way of functioning for human beings. And her point is that, we can understand this default way and we can understand a lot of the mechanics of how it operates and why it operates the way it does if we understand that its root is mental passivity beyond a, a very kind of low level um, of abstract thinking. And so the, I mean, we could really go on with examples, but um, it's the, if you look beyond the kind of first four examples she gives, it, they're much more intuitive. So that, that's part of why I said it's really interesting. She starts with four kind of like remote cases because usually what you do and what Ayn Rand does is that you take what we'll call center of the page examples to get the principle, things that smack you over the head with this is the phenomenon. And then you use the, the principle to untangle very complicated cases or edge kinds of cases. And so it's, uh, I think it's actually easier to have your mind flooded with examples if you set aside for a moment the the kind of um, really fascinating but hard to untangle examples that she starts with. Yeah, you know, when she goes on to the, her examples of specific examples of collectivism, it becomes actually uh, an interesting thing there. She lists, for example, hippies, beatniks, along with the gay libs, the women's libs, uh, and so forth. If anything, we've become less conceptual than that. We've become less conceptual than hippies and yippies and beatniks. And we've really come down to a crude kind of you're gay, straight, black, white, male, female, that sort of 
kind of crude percept, even cruder perceptual level since the example she was talking about. But you, you can see from those examples, she was talking about any kind of groupthink, any kind of, like Don says, insider, outsider, you're an outsider, you're not one of us. And you can clearly see that that's, politics has only become a thousand times worse that way since Ayn Rand wrote 48 years ago about that. Uh, you're part of our group or their group. You're a religious conservative over here, say, that, that, with the right, or you're not part of us. And therefore, we demonize everything that isn't us. And on the left, we demonize everything that doesn't recognize our intersectionality, the priority of our, our way of tr uh, tribalizing people and grouping people. Um, I was uh, going to bring this in a couple of minutes, but given that you have said it, James, um, I was wondering if, uh, as an historian, you can see a degree in which this um, sort of mentality has been more predominant in a culture or or has been more... I mean, one of the things that, that Ayn Rand talks about is that it can be uh, contributed by personal or social cases. Do, do you think that one can study um, in history, if there had been cultures or societies that are more prone to push people away from this kind of mentality? Well, one of the fascinating things she does is she starts with the most primitive level of human development, and she's not shy about using a normative term like savages. When you're at a pre, way pre-civilized level, she's cutting a lot of slack for some of the anti-conceptual mentality there. They are actually in a state of fear and they really aren't aware of how to use their minds in a self-conscious way you know they certainly don't have the logic of aristotle for example on the, so they the, the, ex, their excuse for sticking on a perceptual level my tribe versus the tribe across the river or my color of tribe versus that color of tribe or my religion of tribe versus that religion of the tribe is the way they're going to sort of approach it and if the threat comes from this other tribe, they're just going to keep thinking in that term. There's not going to be anything that elevates them to a higher order of understanding uh, of that. So when we're at the very earliest level of history, prehistory, uh, we're still sort of developing even the crude tools. But once history develops, once writing develops, once some idea of what uh, you know, how to think develops and we get a more advanced civilization, you most definitely can distinguish certain cultures as being more rigid in their racial or caste systems and uh, those that are comparatively. And remember, in history, the three most important words are compared to what are were comparatively uh, open to uh, multi groups, multinationalism, a more, a comparatively more pluralistic society. Um, in the ancient world, I would, for example, cite Rome. Rome sought uh, a multiracial, multireligious, multinational empire, and to have all these, these groups work together and work along and maybe become Roman citizens, uh, the, the elites become members of the Roman state. So with that degree of social mobility, with that degree of internationalism, the, inner, the Roman Empire, for example, was a comparatively, and I do stress the word comparatively, comparatively more pluralistic society than some others. Um, say uh, uh, the Hindis of India, who had a very, very rigid caste system. There really is no social mobility of breaking out of, there, there was no new man as their phenomenon as there was in Rome, where a person could literally come from, say, ex-freed freedmen or slave status of his parents, all the way up to becoming emperor of Rome. That kind of social mobility was sort of unknown uh, to Hindi India, right? And uh, until very recent times, uh, and still is to a certain extent. Uh, so yeah, you can distinguish certain uh, societies uh, on this ground. In modern times, the big one is America. As she points out, America was sort of a machine. And in this essay, she sort of describes the mechanism of it, was sort of a machine of acculturation. Um, there were those who held out immigrant groups, immigrant support groups that would help Italian immigrants like the mafia or uh, Asian immigrant groups, a um, little more benevolent, some maybe not more benevolent. But she points out that those who were really stuck in those ethnic, ethnically focused uh, areas weren't the ones who were breaking out and making great strides as the American economy swept past them uh, with technological and economic progress. Uh, but the best minds from those groups were absorbed in 
uh, over time. That is the mechanism by which America, in effect, broke down uh, uh, the identities in one sense of the, the, the ethnic commitments, the uh, religious traditions, the racial commitments uh, that certain immigrants had. And so from one end, you see the savages. At the other end, you see America, at least for a time, at its height, sort of creating a rational human culture based on ideas as opposed to one based on you know, perceptual level issues like uh, race or gender. Yeah, and I mean, the test that she gives is it's, is it a culture that is shaped or, or let's put it as a question is to what extent does the culture value reason and individualism? And it's to that extent that it's pro conceptual versus anti conceptual. Precisely, because collectivism itself is a form of anti conceptual mentality. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that I've just said is that this mentality can be um, contributed by personal so social cases. And as you have described, it's more or less like the value contributing factors, but, but at the same time, uh, not about better contributing, but there, there are contributing factors. But at the same time, I think the crucial issue is that this mentality is self-made but what what does that mean I, it's one of the things that probably i'm not completely um what does it mean to be for this mentality to be self-made what kind of thoughts or non-thoughts had to be made for these people to um have at the end this kind of mentality well if you think about what her view of free will is it's to exercise the effort to think or not. And it's the, and so what she's examining is in effect, the results of the default. And part of her view is to say that, that if, um, you have free will to say that you have ultimate control over that choice to think or not. You're in the driver's seat. Nobody can make you think nobody can stop you from thinking set aside the issue of force, which introduces a, um, kind of separate factor but it's that insofar as somebody's not like literally pointing a gun at your head um it's that you have the ability to control the use of your mind and so what can others do well think about um like something like exercise right like there's a big difference between if i'm kind of on my own during quarantine and i have to say all right don set aside some time go do push-ups and running and you know everything like that versus I have a personal trainer who comes over every day and is saying, all right, Don, here, you're going to do your push-ups. Now we're going to go over here and run faster, faster, faster. In the end, it's both my free, like in both cases, it's my free will that's the fundamental determiner of whether or not I'm going to get in shape. But it's that if you can have conditions that make it way easier, way easier to uh, exercise that effort, no pun intended, and maintain that effort across time, and then to teach you how to use that effort more efficaciously. So um, part of what happens is if you're routinely a thinker, is that you get better and better at it, you're more at home in it, you're not facing as many internal conflicts about, oh, this is going to put me on the outs with my peer group or something like that. So she definitely thinks that there's things that can encourage or discourage becoming a conceptual level mentality. Um, and things that can discourage it and encourage an anti-conceptual mentality. But in the end, nothing can get around that each person maintains that sovereignty over their own mind. That's ex exactly right. I mean, the world can make it a lot easier or a lot harder to do it. But ultimately, it's there's no nothing that can make you do the effort of thought. And it is that effort of thought that will create a benevolent chain. Uh rewarding you for that. Oh, I grasp that. Mm, I grasp that. Yeah. And you begin to develop that benevolent chain of self-made rationality, a conceptual mentality or not. You know, Ayn Rand asks a couple of interesting questions in this very essay. Questions like why and what for? And when we're young, if we are constantly have on our lips, like often young people do, whys and what fors, if those are encouraged, if, the, if that inquiry is encouraged and developed, helped along 
you can really help develop a conceptual mentality asking for causes, asking for future. Oh, what does that imply about the future? And how did that come about? Why did that happen? That encourages the lift to the conceptual mentality. And uh, I've, the horrible stories that I've heard from so many people that when they were children, they would be ridiculed even for that mentality by teachers or parents. Oh, well, ask my own wife tells the story when she was a child. Oh, well, ask, ask Holly. She's always got the answer. Or she always asked the question why. So asking the question why or having the answer is discouraged when you've got that like progressive education, as is mentioned here in the essay, when you've got progressive education that doesn't train a conceptual mentality, but talks about social adjustment and fitting in, you've just encouraged an anti-conceptual mentality and groupthink. And given that you mentioned the anti-causality mentality, James, um, I, one of the things that I was going to bring was two essays that we discussed in the past weeks, which are the metaphysical versus the mind-made and causality versus duty. And how can one integrate these um, essays or what Ayn Rand is saying in these essays to this type of mentality? Is she trying to explain why does that, does that kind of... Uh, thinking that derives from the pre previous essays comes from? Or... She directly refers to the metaphysical versus the man-made here. And she specifically says that that's inca you're incapable of making that distinction mentally if you are an anti-conceptual mentality. That is a high order of conceptual understanding. It is simply unavailable to the conceptual mentality to make the distinction. And so the natural consequence of that is they will treat the man-made as metaphysical and the metaphysical as man-made, which is really one of the fundamental features of collectivism, groupthink, racism, tribalism. They treat the metaphysical as sort of a moral issue and the man-made is sort of a given. Our emotions, that's a given. The, moral import, the morally important things about us, that's perceptual level. Whereas the, you know, uh, the metaphysical, the stuff we really have to consider, that has to be discovered scientifically, rationally. And you have to learn that that's not us. That's not what I'm in control of. That's a highly complex conceptual distinction. And unless you could, at the level of being able to make that distinction, you're hopeless in terms of really being able to understand the issue. She directly refers to the fact that the, something like the metaphysical for, versus the man-made is ungraspable by the uh, anti-conceptual mentality. And they thus treat the two as complete opposites. So dealing with this, one, one of the conclusions uh, or one of the things that follow from this kind of mentality is not thinking about the future. And, and I think that was the, um, one of the reasons why I could more or less under, understand the, the thing that Ayn Rand is trying to convey here. And, and the thing that came into my mind was the... Uh, I think it's from The Simpsons. I haven't really watched that uh, series, but I think the, the, the joke is, you know, he, the guy is drinking and someone is going to tell, well, don't drink that much. Uh, you're going to be hungover tomorrow. And the guy answers, well, that's uh, Homer Simpson's problem of tomorrow, not, not me. Um, but how how can one... How can that be sustainable, sustainable from a psychological level? And uh, probably what I'm trying to get, the, the place where I'm trying to get is the fear factor. Um, but what is the relationship between a conception of the future and such an emotion as, as fear? The future can only be grasped conceptually. The future is only available to our minds conceptually. No one can actually predict the future with certainty. The, one of the great powers of the conceptual mentality is we can project different future alternatives. The only way we're going to end up being a species that can play golf on the moon and project that kind of alternative future is to have a high order conceptual mentality. If you do not have confidence with your conceptual mentality, 
your main source of knowledge, your main source of your tool of survival, your, your main source of control is gone and fear will characterize your psychology. It's really that simple. But it is true you can't maintain it. You couldn't really live that in a fully consistent way. Some future uh, planning has to be, I have to go to the market tomorrow. I have to go to the doctor next week. Some very immediate level planning is necessary, I think, for any of us to survive. But anything beyond like planning a market trip or a, a doctor's appointment is asking you to think conceptually, asking you to rise up above that level. Oh, why? You know, what is that? What, am I, what is my real purpose there? <clears throat> Did I answer the question? It does. Thank you. Um... And probably um, one of the things that I'm also not completely clear about is this example that she gives of the traditionalist versus the college activist. She, she talks about the traditionalist saying, what's good enough for my father is good enough for me. And, but, but what I don't get completely, and I, probably it's because I, I'm not completely aware of the, the person that she's describing is the other one, the college activist who says that if it's not good enough for my dad, then it's not good enough for me. The um, contrarian, you see, because it's tradition, it's, it's presumptively out. <laughs> you know, you've got Hayek's theory, right, of, of human development and politics. If it's tradition, it's presumptively in <laughs> because evolution has to be trusted, says Hayek. For the, uh, that's sort of your right wing traditionalist, uh, with well, one model of it. But the, a lot of the left, especially in her time in the late 60s or 70s, was simply contrarian. Don't trust anyone over 30 was one of their, <laughs> one of their uh, slogans. Uh, so it, to her, a, a lot of it struck her as they're just saying they're being nihilists almost uh, on, in principle. It was tradition, therefore it's out. <laughs> Which is just as anti-conceptual <laughs> as the traditionalists saying, well, we give, we've got, we're going to go with tradition unless there's a reason to do otherwise. You know, cannibalism and human sacrifice were traditions that lasted among humans for millennia without anyone questioning them. But, I mean, probably, um, is, isn't it the case rather that if it's, that it should be put more in the, in, in the sense of, if it's good enough for my father, then it's not good enough for me. Th that should be the, the proper way of conceptualizing it. Or, or it, should it be put more in personal terms it, for, for, a, for a conceptual thinking person? Should it be put in terms of um, if it's good, is it good enough for me? Instead of um, thinking about well, if you were to ask the people. question substantively, <laughs> right? What is good for me? <laughs> and you'd be focused on what is actually good for you in the long run. As opposed to, hey, that was grandpa, bad. Or, hey, that was grandpa, good, presumptively good. It's a question of you're walking in the door, you presume tradition is out or you presume tradition is in. Neither are thinking conceptually. Those are both non-conceptual approaches to the entire matter of how we deal with received tradition. <laughs> one says presumptively good, one says presumptively bad. Both are anti-conceptual and both lead to group thinking, collectivist thinking. And given that, what is the relationship between the anti-conceptual mentality and um collectivism is it an if and only if relationship is it the case that all collectivists are um anti-conceptual or, or is it that and is it also the all the non-conceptual are collectivists or um or, or is it that only in certain cases there is and, and it's reinforcing, but it's not an only if and only if relationship. So, I mean, collectivism the, is an ideology, or it's a it's a it's a 
uh, abstract perspective. Like it's um, so you can think of Marxism as an ideology and Marxism is not anti-conceptual as an ideology. And indeed, part of what Ayn Rand, part of her view of the reason that Marxism doesn't actually take hold amongst the working class you know, across the world is that it's a really intellectual perspective of, oh, there's a commonality amongst people uh, despite national origin, despite race, despite sex, we share this thing as we, we're the global proletariat. And her view is that in practice, um, collectivism is it functions as anti-conceptual. And that's why what actually happens is that you don't get a, a group working class. You get the balkanization of people dividing into more perceptual level kinds of groups, you know, down to skin color and other physiological characteristics. You know, e even nationalism um, is a little more sophisticated. I mean, a little more sophisticated than, than the kind of lowest common denominator kind of functioning you get. But certainly she thinks that like insofar as um, the anti-conceptual mentality gets controls what kind of politics that a culture has, then it's going to be collectivist in, in, in the sense that it's not going to value the individual because individualism is a conceptual achievement. And so, for instance, you know, she attacks the anarchists and one of the things that she thinks is phony about the, you know, the anarcho-capitalists as they would call themselves is the idea that they're posing as individualists. And it's no, like you can't be an individualist if you're rejecting objectivity, if you're rejecting reason. Um, individualism is, a, is an achievement because part of the whole perspective is what makes you an individual is your mind. And what individualism means in politics is object a, a system based on objectivity that puts the use of force under objective control and it's that precisely that they're trying to thwart so um they're not totally overlapping but the but there's a strong relationship between the two i would go so far as to say that collectivism is necessarily grounded in, in anti the psychopistemology of anti-conceptual mentality. It cannot exist without it. Ayn Rand, for example, goes out of her way to say that there are rational human associations. If they're voluntary, if they're principled, then there's a rational human association. She also goes so far as to say, you know, not there's it's not as though we, we have to not consider there's no difference between men and women. Not of course, of course not. There could be real differences between men and women. The difference between a collectivist mentality about associate human associations and groups, or the differences between people, and a rational one, is precisely the conceptual mentality. A conceptual mentality that will ha understand individualism. Now, if you understand individualism and reason appropriately, then there are all, all kinds of rational, voluntary human associations that Ayn Rand is saying that those are good. And Ayn Rand would not say that there aren't differences between men and women. She's saying they're not. <laughs> You'd have to be conceptual to understand where they're relevant, not relevant. Do they matter? How do they matter? If they matter? So it's the anti-conceptual mentality that gives collectivism its crude uh, in a, inability to properly understand <laughs> what's really going on. Whereas the conceptual mentality opens up our understanding of people, even in groups, or even opens up the possibility of a rational, voluntary association of people. It's not that groups as such can't be analyzed or, or be joined. No. And the difference is a conceptual approach to it. So I would say, yeah. So I'll go so far as to say that after I've read this essay a few times in my life, I believe, well, just as Dr. Peacock points out in Opar, capitalism is grounded in necessarily in good epistemo psychopistemology, and the attack on capitalism is necessarily grounded in bad epistemology. And here we have a really classic example of it. Collectivism and groupthink, insofar as it's an error, is necessarily an anti-conceptual error. It's not as though human associations or the analysis of certain groups is always wrong. It's the role of reason and individualism. Does that make sense? It does. Um, another point that, that is made, and, and I think 
it would be interesting to relate it to philosophy who needs it is basically that for this kind of mentality, integration is replaced by association. Uh, but at the same time, wh why is it uh, replaced by association? What, why is it not replaced by a vacuum or by becoming the sort of uh, Diogenes or, or I, I don't know, like Kratos in, in ancient Greece? We need concepts like this. It's the reason. It's sort of the same reason why there's religion before there's philosophy, and why humans are necessarily. We need to. If we can't conceptualize properly, we need to have some kind of understanding of the world around us. Nonetheless, nonetheless, and this is what fills in the gaps. This is what substitutes when you don't have a proper conceptual mentality. It's got to work on certain levels. It's got to sort of figure out what's right and wrong and whether this war is justifiable or not, or whether this attack is something we should respond to, or on a very practical, almost perceptual level. <clears throat> of course, we're still conceptual beings, <clears throat> but we have to, we really do have to understand what we're doing at some level. We need a kind of philosophy, even if it's a crude, religious, collectivist, only semi-conceptual approach to it. But that's what substitutes when you don't have a proper rational philosophy. But, to, but human beings, I think, have got to operate at some level, at that level. I mean, the way that Shaw often put it is that the, that the mind is an integrating mechanism. That the, and so the question is not, are you going to integrate? Or to put it in philosophic terms, not, are you going to have a philosophy or philosophic conclusions? It's that, are you going to take control of them, do it consciously and deliberately at the conceptual level? So there's going to be connections that your mind is making but that are they going to be deliberate and conceptual? Are they going to be associational, which is mean, which means connections by chance connections, typically in the basis of non-essentials and in without any sort of coherent structure to them. And so that that's the reason why, like, even if you took like a cratalus, like that is not anti-conceptual in the relevant sense. It was this guy took ideas seriously, reached horrifically wrong ideas, and then deliberately on principle stuck by them to the point of not talking. Right. So that's <laughs> that's very different. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's very different than like the people you'd meet at a Trump rally or, you know, screaming at an intersectionality protest. Like you're de you're dealing with a different kind of universe there. Yeah. Yeah, and let's face it, it, you know, there are all kinds of psychological associations, if we're not thinking, that we could crudely make. You know, some, take an example I had. I lived in Brooklyn for a while. I was robbed and beat up on the streets of Brooklyn. I come back and I talked to various people about the experience. There was actually a certain mentality that asked me, well, what race were they? Are you going to hold it out against all African Americans because there was a group of African Americans who did that to you? Well, if I wasn't a conceptual mentality, and could look beyond that and say, no, of course not. I met a lot of nice, nonviolent African-Americans. But if I was thinking only on the perceptual level, how easy it would have been to take that suggestion and say, ah, yes, it's my group versus their group. It's those blacks versus whites. That's that's really the, the source of it, I think. Thank you. So I would like to move uh, the discussion towards the clinging to the group. But first, we have a question. Um, I don't know where it comes from. Rasi doesn't tell me um, from the chat. So, but please, if you're on YouTube, uh, feel free to send a super chat with your question. We will be happy to answer it. Um, so the question is, um, why are so many objectives prone to rationalism? One. Uh, wondering if we can tie that to the common errors we see from people who are interested in objectivism. And then question mark at the end. Well, and I'll tie this a little bit to what we're talking about here. So, you know, one of the points that we make as pro free market people is that it's really wrong to ask why are people poor? The question is why are some people in some countries so rich? 
And you can ask what one mistake could be, well, why are people anti-conceptual? But no, the question is like, well, why are some conceptual? Like that's the surprise. That's what the real achievement is. And it's the same thing with, with rationalism in many ways. Um, the question is not why are some objectivists rationalistic? The question is like, how is objectivity possible? Like is, that is not obvious. It's not the default by any means that, and if you look at how kind of ideas, the model for understanding ideas that people who are interested in ideas receive, they're very rationalistic. Now there's other things to say about that, which is, so Leonard has a view in understanding objectivism, um, or maybe it's objectivism through induction where he makes this point, but I think it's an understanding of objectivism where he thinks that what it is, is it's a, a uh, I forget the exact word he uses, but it's in effect a kind of tech, uh, tactic for coping with the challenge of thinking abstractly. It's that you get swamped by these enormous abstractions that are really hard to hold in mind and really hard to do anything with. And you resort to something that seems a lot simpler. It's I'm overwhelmed. So I'm going to latch onto something where I feel secure. Right? This is going to be my axiom, even if I don't consciously call it an axiom and i'm going to deduce everything step by step from this without looking at reality reality is too messy that's too hard and and so it's kind of like a security blanket so that's far from unique to objectivists and it's a really understanding sort of thing so the real the real issue is not why are many objectivists uh rationalistic it's well how do we become more objective given that you know there's these temptations if you want to call it that of other ways of functioning. And it's really hard to know what conceptual functioning looks like. Yeah, before objectivism, what were your alternatives in effect? Uh, the, you know, in my own history, to give you my own history, it's because I was interested in ideas. Rationalism is a disease of intellectuals. It really is. If you don't consider, if you're not operating in the idea, in the world of high abstractions, if you don't think ideas are what you should be focused on and worried about, you're not likely to fall into a rationalist syndrome. And so it's statistically not surprising that there are more rationalists, you know, than empiricists, but both are not objectivism. Both are not objectivism. And uh, in derationalizing myself because of the rationalism that I was trained in with education, education had really, and religion had really drilled it into my head. That's the only way we can think about philosophy. So only way we can think about religion is in a purely deductive way. And that corrupted my thinking, but it was Ayn Rand who derationalized me. Um, it just happened that I was interested in Ayn Rand because I was interested in philosophy and ideas. And I think that's why you have that statistical breakdown. But Don's absolutely right. What we have now is a, a world where a third option is open objectivism. And that's really how do we achieve that from I, wherever we're coming from, from an inferior position. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I actually, I, I read it. I read it in a anti-conceptual way. Uh, I just went through the question without reading it in advance. And uh, even though you answered it, uh, I read some things that I shouldn't have, but um, anyway, I, I was wondering if we could um, go through the clinging. Wh why do the anti-conceptual mentalities tend to cling to groups? What, what is, and I ran discusses it. Why, why is it, the, what, what is the reason why this kind of mentality drives people to search for some groups where they can be they feel more comfortable with in so if we put it in terms of the the free will issue right it's that if this is your your what happens the question being what happens when you default on your means of survival what happens when you default on your ability to think well you it's one way that shulson has put it is it's self-made blindness and so it's a real feeling of being out of control. Like you have the real experience of like, I have to make decisions a lot. Like I'm facing certain threats, certain dangers, and I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And so you're looking for a source of safety. And so it's the idea of, look, these people will tell me what to do. And that's why she says like the core dynamic is that people in effect trade the um, effort of taking responsibility for your mind and your life 
they hand that over to the group. They'll give it blind obedience in return for that safety. And so it's, it, and the, the whole, the whole dynamic is the the fears emerging from you when you don't think you experience that as being out of control, you experience it as a negative of not knowing where you are. And I mean, you can think about like a, if you've ever woken up in an unfamiliar place, like a hotel room, that's really dark and you're trying to get around it's It can be really scary. You're like, am I going to bump into walls and things like now imagine that that's your life. Your whole experience is kind of bumping around the dark and you don't know if you're going to step into a giant, you know, um, pit of snakes. And then, some people come along and they say, hey, don't worry. As long as you just give obedience and loyalty to me, well, I'll, I'll tell you what to do and you'll be okay. Well, it's, huh. And okay, fine. I'll, I'll take that deal. And there's no real question of like, well, do they know what they're doing? It's no, that like that that's their responsibility. I'm not going to be concerned with it. And I mean, you meet people like this all the time. Like even people who, you know, the kind of person who just defers to the experts, like, well, who am I to know? There's smart people in Washington taking care of the economy. It's sure, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's going to work out. Um, there's that kind of like handing off responsibility. And there's, there's a real kind of, um, I think you can see why that would happen to somebody who's unwilling to rise to the conceptual level and formulate long-term principles about, no, this is what's right. This is what's true. I'm going to conduct my life in this way. I have a wonderful example. I was working at a, the county courthouse as a DA, and we'd had a fire drill a few days earlier in which they'd gone through what you do and why you do it and why this is dangerous and why this is the safe place, and this is where we're all going to meet outside and everyone use this exit. They'd gone through the fire drill, explained the rationale for it. It was reasonable. The following week, a fire breaks out in the courthouse. Everyone responds and leaves. They're gathering. Nearly everyone is gathering at the very place they said not to gather. This is dangerous. Don't be there. You'll block the fire trucks. This is not where you're safest. Literally, me and one other guy went to the place where they explained to us was safest. I later talked to the group over there and was like, why were you guys over there? Just a few days ago, they told us this is the safe place to be. Well, this is where everyone, this is literally the answer I got. This is where everyone was going. And if I was going to be wrong, at least I'd be there with everyone else. And uh, clearest example I have of exactly that kind of groupthink mentality where you've ex been explained just a few days earlier the objective reasons for why you go here instead of there, but they felt more comfortable going with the group because the large group was there. Well, and I like that example. That were just told. I like that example because part of what it gets across is it's not crazy in a certain context. Like, I, for sure. I've been in context like you go into, you know, an unfamiliar situation, right? And you don't know what the heck you're supposed to be doing. So you look around and say, well, what is everybody else doing? And well, I, since I don't have any other, anything else to go on, let's say, yeah, I guess I will follow them. Like it's not the, it's not always a dumb thing to do, but it's, it, so you can see like, all right, there's a certain appeal to it. And then the, the danger is if you make that your way of life and if you don't, and in cases where you do have alternative sources of information, um, you know, if it's not just kind of a trivial thing, like, wait, am I supposed to be waiting in line? Should I be going back to my seat to wait? Like once you get above that kind of trivial situation, it can become a very detrimental uh, and disastrous mode of functioning as, as Jim's example uh, horrifyingly illustrates. Yes, um, we have, I think, two questions, but first, um, what is the, um, so one, one of the things that Rand says is that this common images that replace abstractions, like the, the, these associations that replace abstractions um, are other things that unite groups into one uh or not unite but uh, well, they you, they united as as groups as tribes um do you think that that 
kind of thinking explains why in the Middle Ages uh, there was such a big fragmentation of the of the in Europe after the Roman um, after Rome collapsed. And also, do you think that it explains why countries in Europe are also trying are, are also experiencing this? Um, aims of, of secession, such as in Catalonia or uh, I think Corsica in, in 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 France. Isn't it mind blowing? You know, we come we go to the idea. Well, a legitimate nation is where all the French people have control of French of, of French things. But that well, wait a minute. What about the Navarrese? What about those in Andorra? What about <laughs> and suddenly it becomes even more stratified? You can talk about Scottish independence. Well, what about? Oh, wait a minute here. Are all Scots created equal? It be, it's a bizarre how it can actually. Once you start broke trying to break down political legitimacy in terms of collectivist or ethnic or religious or racial grounds, how it quickly can break down into even smaller and smaller and smaller subunits. Is it satisfactory to give the Croats and the Serbs independent? Countries? countries? Are there divisions within the Serbs and the Croats? Uh, it become an endless thing of uh, redefining your groups. Absolutely. <laughs> but the whole idea that political legitimacy is grounded in some kind of historical accident or ethnic you know, history is an anti-conceptual approach to the whole matter of what a legitimate government is. Is it a legitimate government because finally all the Serbs are in Serbia and all the Croats are in their own country? No. That's perfectly arbitrary. Justice in Croatia is justice in Serbia. Justice in Serbia is justice in Croatia. The mere fact that the Serbs and the Croats have their own countries now is totally an anti-conceptual approach uh, uh, to the entire subject of political legitimacy. Um, yeah, I, one of them, recently I've been studying a little bit of Middle Ages history specifically in, in the UK. And one of the things that has struck me the most is how bizarre, specifically in territorial division, I think that that's one of the ways in, w in which I see it, how bizarre it is. And one of the craziest examples is uh, St. Pancras, which is one area of, of London, uh, used to be a borough. Um, someone had one specific fuel uh, administration of it. But when you see the St. Pancras Cemetery, it's, it's like 10 miles away from, from the borough. And it's a whole mess, a whole mess of uh, how everything is distributed. But anyway, that's a whole issue in itself. And sadly, we don't have Nikos, which is the expert on that. And he will be having, a, he will be publishing his book on that kind of uh, thinking in the future. Um, so we have a couple of questions. Um, Christopher Smith said in the chat says that objectivism through induction is the antidote, antidote to rationalism. Do any of you have any thoughts about that and the importance of this course? Well, I'd say broadly, Leonard has done more than anybody to define the nature of the problem and give a solution. I think that course in particular, along with understanding objectivism, gives a huge lead to anybody who wants to deal with rationalism. Um, but I think more broadly, you can put it just exposing yourself to good thinkers and notice like, wow, they approach it very differently than I do. And what part of what you get from understanding objectivism is kind of an explication of, right, well, that's what they're doing differently. But um, it's like so many things, it's not listening to the course, it's actually doing the work, doing the assignments there, but then more carrying that methodology of being really at home with concretes uh, that comes through in that course. So, I mean, I think it's indispensable for somebody who really wants to grapple with these issues. Um, but I, I would put it in the context of Leonard's overall work, um, that has been indispensable. Yes. And induction properly done is truly the antidote to, uh, you know, doing it, practicing it, as Don says, habituating 
an inductive approach to your own basic thinking is probably the best thing you can do to derationalize yourself, get yourself focused on the relationship between the concretes that the concept is integrating uh, and bear that in mind and hold that through. Yeah. The other question asks, uh, what needs to happen for objectivist epistemology to have an impact, or at least for something like the anti-conceptual mentality to be explicitly called out as part of uh, as part of public discourse, for example, around wokeness? Philosophers, well, philosophers of education are the primary cause and responsibility of this. This happens at philosophy. If people are undermined on their uh, basics of philosophy, objectivism is the answer. Objectivism getting at least a voice in philosophy is really the answer, the only real answer. It is philosophy that has generated the problem with this misunderstanding of, of concepts. Uh, Kant in particular, his destruction of concepts. It's modern philosophy that lays at the root of it. Yeah, I think fundamentally that's right, though I think in practice I think about it a little more tactically, which is, so one view you could have what is, well, we're all screwed until people study introduction to objectivist epistemology. <clears throat> but that's not right. It's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's that people need to be more conceptual and it's not an all or nothing thing. And indeed, you part of what you get in this essay is the way in which it's not an all or nothing thing. And Ayn Rand thinks the most tragic thing is the better people who are kind of not, they don't want to go, they can see what's wrong with like the full on activist tribalist. And yet they don't know how to disentangle themselves from it. They don't know how to be fully conceptual. And so what you need to do is that if, on any given issue, you bring uh, a conceptual approach to it. You model what it looks like to think in principle. And um, I, I think a good kind of example of how this can happen and, and can be done really effectively in even in a, a seemingly narrow issue is what Alex Epstein does in The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. That is, he gives a really useful, explicit framework for how to think about things. We need to be clear in our goal. Are we trying to achieve human flourishing or zero impact on the planet? Are we going to look at, on, he gives uh, a methodology for answering that question. We have to look at the uh, big picture. We have to look at the full context. We can't be biased. Um, we have to be even handed. And then it's, we have to be precise. We can't be vague and sloppy. So it's, you're giving people tools to be conceptual thinkers that they can see, yeah, those tools make sense. I, I it totally makes sense. I'd want to know what my goal is and I'd want to uh, not be biased and not be sloppy. And I think that that, and then on energy issues and environmental issues, you can show, all right, here's how to use that framework and become a bit, a, a better thinker. And so I think what it's that kind of modeling, all right, here's the framework that will help clarify this issue. And then if you have a lot of people on a lot of issues doing that you get you create a lot better thinkers at least on certain issues in the culture and the culture becomes more conceptual and so the the it fundamentally yes the answer is the objectivist philosophy and the objectivist epistemology but you you need to think about it in um a a as i was saying in a more tactical sort of way yeah, and it's that mid-level that, that is important. It's like we, the application of it everywhere we see it, the application to every policy issue, to every question, like, like Alex Epstein is doing such a brilliant job in doing with energy. As Don points out, he's being conceptual. He's explicit about his method. He's clear in, about being conceptual from concretes to abstractions and then applying the abstractions to policy considerations and being conceptual in that way. Or in my own work, I don't give a lecture on objectivism or objectivist epistemology. I just approach it inductively and conceptually. And that's what we need is just a lot more work, independent work on every issue at that mid-level, uh, just exercising that conceptual mentality. And I mean, this is to bring in another uh, perspective on looking at this. Um, Leonard Peikoff has a book called The Dim Hypothesis. And part of his perspective is that philosophy is spread through a culture not primarily by people preaching philosophy right like it's not that the man in the street 
you know, went to a comp lecture one day and it was like, oh man, that guy's really got it figured out. Rather, he thinks it's through certain cultural products that feature a certain approach to integration, to epistemology, um, in, in science, in education, in art in all of these different fields that's how philosophy shapes a culture and so it's that what you need is cultural products that have the right epistemological conceptual which is an, an equivalent to an integrate uh, an integrative uh, approach to whatever field you're dealing with right right No, of course, the big philosophers are the most. Look at what Alex Epstein is doing. He's applying, in effect, Ayn Rand's ideas. So when we get the 30,000 foot elevation, we'll still be able to say, well, yeah, Aristotle, Plato and Aquinas and Kant and Ayn Rand were the ones who were behind the revolution in the mental approach. But it is those applications. If, if Aquinas didn't result in a high Middle Ages and Renaissance, no one would have ever heard of Aquinas. So... It's that mid-level stuff, all the stuff that occurred between Aquinas and the Renaissance and in the Renaissance that gave flesh to the revolution, that uh, the neo-Aristotelianism that Aquinas gave the West, for example. I'm, Don, given that you mentioned the dim hypothesis, and for the people who are listening to it, basically, Dr. Pickup mentions five, five different people, t types of... Uh, psychopistemologies um, one of them is integration and the other ones are misintegration and disintegration in, in different degrees but the type of mentality that we're talking about do you think it would be that it could be categorized as one of these five um, mentalities no I, I it's too complicated to get in exactly what uh leonard's view is um but i the i would definitely not try to blend this with um dim categories agreed agreed dim so should... just just to give one just a kind of one sentence reasoning why he thinks these are all deliberate and intellectual like d is not just people who aren't very thoughtful no it's people who have an actual theory that the right way to function in this field is not to integrate precisely precisely correct no we would have to do a whole a sat, s series of saturday sessions on the dim hypothesis and it'd be worth doing by the way but we'd need to do a whole uh, seminar course on dim <laughs> you can't do it here <laughs> We're minutes remaining <laughs> um so moving forward I, I would like to talk about two more um topics the first one is something that you don't already touch a little bit on which is mixed cases and then um, I would like to discuss a little bit of, on the uh, evolutionary hypothesis of Rand. Um, so Rand talks about the, the mixed cases of people that know that there is something wrong, um, but at the same time, they don't, they're not completely on the better side of the or they can be on the better side, but at the same time, they're not completely um, integrated in this regard. So, and, and probably as, as you can see in the way that I'm formulated, I'm not completely clear of what this means. Is it something that it's built upon, that, that, it, that it's like more like a vicious cycle that it takes you to a well, the way she path? Actually, the way she initially explains it is that they feel something's wrong, but they were never taught how to think. We really have to, you know, I couldn't have come up with Aristotle's uh, achievement in logic had I lived 2,300 years ago. Uh, and yet I tremendously benefit from it. It's, it's not that simple because there are bad ideas that are also like Kantian ideas that are also playing into this. But part of it is just an awareness of learning how to think. It's not obvious. It's a discovery itself. Epistemology, psychoepistemology, logic, those themselves are human discoveries that will greatly increase our ability to think. So to the degree that you're t given confidence in your ability to think and taught how to think, you can break out of this, at least volitionally. Uh, the formulation she puts there, I think, is a very 
actually benevolent and almost non-judgmental one. They simply haven't been taught how to think. Thank you. Um, so I think it would be interesting to move to the last factor. Um, and probably the introduction to that is that I would like us to answer a little bit on one of the claims that I once heard about against Ayn Rand. And this person said, uh, well, you know, Ayn Rand confessed that she didn't know what evolution was. And and her <laughs> and actually her statement is, uh, I'm not a student of evolution. But what does that mean? Because I, I think that some of her ethics seems to be at least more or less inspired in in evolution. I, I don't I don't want to. No. I think she 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 must have known the theory. I think that's the best way to put it. Could you comment on that? None of her philosophy. She wants none of her philosophy because the nature of philosophy is that it is prior to science. Philosophy as such should, in her view, avoid armchair physics and guessing cosmology, the entire subject of philosophical cosmology she thought should be thrown out. That's philosophers speculating about what they should not be speculating about. And so philosophy coming before, talking about the methods that science itself refers to, cannot itself rely or be dependent on any particular science, nor was she an expert in any particular science. And so she hesitated, one, as a non-biologist to make any significant pronouncement on the subject, but two, she wanted to make sure that her philosophy could be understood without an understanding of evolution. I happen to agree with you. I don't think really she, I think in many places, she confesses sort of an understanding of evolution and that she buys into evolution, generally speaking, but she's very careful to say, I'm not a biologist. I have no opinion on it as a theory of biology. <clears throat> and more than that, philosophy does not depend on and shouldn't engage in that sort of scientism or cosmology. And so she think... kept the two separate. Yeah, I think the right way to think about it is very similar to what she said about the Industrial Revol uh, Revolution. It's that she couldn't have discovered her theory without the Industrial Revolution, not because the Industrial Revolution created new facts about man's fundamental nature, but it clarified or brought to the forefront certain facts that one, she didn't think would be in a position to notice and grasp and conceptualize very easily, if at all. Uh, without seeing, oh, the most abstract knowledge is vitally um, is vital to human survival here and now, and we can um, see progress not over eons, but within our lifetime if we're able to use our mind in order to produce better and better ways. And I think there's something similar in evolution. I don't think she like read Darwin and just wasn't willing to tell us or something like that. But if you think about what post Darwin um, did is in the air kind of it was a view of living species as oriented towards a struggle for survival and that everything about them was oriented towards serving these survival needs and 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 that we almost take as like well that was obvious and common sense that was not at all obvious or common sense a, a few hundred years ago that it, if it was we're in an unchanging world where everything is designed by god as part of his plan um, th there's those kinds of views that, and there's, there's even in Greece, but there is not this perspective that there's a struggle for survival and everything is oriented towards that. And I think that was a kind of perspective that she inherited from Darwin, though I don't think from reading him. I think that's true. I don't think she read Darwin, but I think she was aware of it. And I think that that did, you know, sort of factor in to things. You notice though, she did not commit like the error of Herbert Spencer. You know, in the wake of Darwinism and, wow, everyone being impressed with the theory of natural selection, everything, it was sort of the fad, everything was evolution, everything was natural selection. And a political thinker, even a better political thinker like Herbert Spencer, got all screwed up and messed up his whole political philosophy by, well, he knew Huxley, you know, he knew this, the group around Darwin, so he was profoundly influenced by them. Just as, I think, more recently in the last half of the 20th century and the 
start of the 21st century, everything's genetics, genes, genes, genes. When science makes a discovery, it's sort of the fad that it occupies everyone's head for a while. It did not do that with Ayn Rand. What's interesting is she was not sucked into social Darwinism or Darwinistic type fads because she didn't use evolution itself philosophically. All the facts of reality inform her philosophy. And so if she's heard of evolution and that's probably the way it goes, that's got to be consistent. I'm not a scientist. I can't have a strong opinion one way or another. But all the facts of reality have to be consistent with my philosophy. That's kind of the way she approached it. Not getting sucked into, say, an intellectual fad like, say, Herbert Spencer was. She's a conceptual mentality. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, thank you very much for answering that. Um, so... Her claim is that maybe this kind of mentality, and and that, that's maybe it's she she herself put, puts it as a hypothesis, is that maybe this kind of mentality um, can explain the lost, the, the missing link, of um, a, a bit between the ape and the and man, and given that we're on the last 10 minutes of the discussion and given that you've summarized the the essence of the article as do not fall um, into this kind of thinking I was wondering you could make some closing remarks on the importance of of that and on and the importance of not not falling into this kind of mentality and what is the alternative and why this alternative of the conceptual mentality is a good strategy um, and why it's useful to to be that like that we'll say something um first of all i don't understand what she's saying like uh, the evolution connection I, i i don't really get um what point she's making if she means it literally how she's thinking of the missing link but i think you can kind of set that aside and, and uh, maybe Jim, you have some thoughts on it. Um, I think the, one of the points that we didn't get to talk about that I thought was really, really fascinating and really should resonate with most people is she talks about how the people with an anti-conceptual mentality, um, they can sort of get by and function that way unless they're challenged by outsiders, challenged psycho challenge philosophically in other words they're the the traditions or assumptions the kind of in-group way of looking and thinking about things if that's challenged the way she puts it is all hell breaks loose and you can the, we will often have the experience of and i think even better people can have this experience of your your worldviews being challenged And it feels a little scary, right? Like, oh my gosh, I've like this is my whole way of looking at things. It's the whole way I judge myself. And somebody has this argument that I can't answer right away. Uh oh, like, but the what the anti conceptual mentality is, is something way deeper and way more terrifying than that. Because it's not just like the conclusions I've reached by my mind might be wrong and I have to reach new conclusions. It's that you didn't reach those conclusions with your mind. And so it's the, the thing I'm asking of you, which is use your mind to question everything. Um, you don't know how to do. That's the whole problem is that you haven't used your mind. You've reached all these wrong conclusions. And so it's like you have to start from zero without even a tool that you have confidence in. And that's kind of the root of how terrifying it is for somebody to have their kind of uh, anti-conceptual framework question. And so... Um, you know, one sort of takeaway is like, you don't want to be in that position. On the contrary, it's that the more conceptual you are, the more that you're on the premise of, I want to know it's true and I'm willing to exert the mental effort um, come what may, then then you never have to be scared because you'll have, you'll have confidence that even if you reach a wrong conclusion, your tool for reaching conclusions is powerful, able to function. You'll have confidence in it. And you know that all that can come from, examining even an argument that seems to throw doubt on some of your you know most fundamental beliefs is 
I'll get, I'll, I'll have a better idea of what's true. And that's good for me. So it's like part of the benefit of being a conceptual level thinker is that there's no such thing as a threat that comes from somebody else's argument or something like that. It's all to the good. And that the less conceptual you are, the more that you're putting yourself in that position of having to be terrified every time you encounter something new or something different. That was essentially the point I was going to make. I think I only made better by Don. Um, the one thing I did want to mention before we uh, leave the lectures, for example, on mafia and right wing um, uh, libertarians, let's use the word, who are anarchists. I knew Murray Rothbard in the 19 early 80s, and I don't know whether he discussed it earlier or not, but he, after this essay, I, I know, he embraced the idea of that the mafia was a, a form of government, a private form of government. He would, I literally had discussions with, with uh, Professor Rothbard, the leading libertarian intellectual at the time, an anarcho-capitalist, and he embraced, uh, perhaps he'd read this essay, I, I didn't ask that, I don't know for sure, but certainly by the early 1980s, Murray Rothbard was absolutely pointing out that, you know, in The Godfather, how Vito Corleone has this sense of honor Gosh, isn't that good? Isn't that at least as good as our government? He literally, literally was living in a world so disconnect, so unconceptual, if you will, where the concretes and the concepts that he was working with are so dis disparate, so disconnected that if you were to say to him, hey, Dr. Rothbard is an anarchist, aren't you really saying that it's a world where mafia versus mafia, gang versus gang controls everything? It he would nod at me and say, yeah, well, that, wouldn't that be a better world? It, not literally concretizing what that means. Constant mafia wars. <laughs> I, I, I would just look at him as astonished. But the only way I could explain that would be the anti-conceptual mentality. Thank you. Um, I, I, I come from a country that it's just that um, uh, ma mafia rule and everything like that. But that's a whole different story. Um, thank you, Don. Thank you, James. Is there anything else that you would like to to say, or or to announce to advertise? No. Well, no. But I mean, I will. Uh, I'll say since we do have a couple more minutes. Um, this is a topic that Ayn Rand's writing about. I mean, at least 1970 to 1977. So I think the first place she starts talking about some of these ideas, I mean, there's some roots of it in her article on racism and an in introduction to objectivist epistemology, but it's really with the Comprachicos, the age of envy in 70, 71, all the way through global balkanization. And so um, I think going through all of these places where she's talking about tribalism, the anti-conceptual mentality, it's really valuable. And I think, as I said, uh, I think we're coming back to some more of those pieces. And so I think we'll get a fuller picture of the varieties of this and the causes and consequences, but it's a really rich topic. And indeed, if you look at the cultural discussion for the last five years, tribalism has been like people realize there's a real issue here. One recommendation is um, Alain Journo on New Ideal wrote a piece on tribalism where he takes the threads of Ayn Rand's comments and then connects them to today's debate, including people's attempts to understand tribalism and like the way in which they don't view it as kind of a default that we have a way out of. But most of the scholars think of tribalism as kind of an inescapable feature of humanity and and not something that we can think our way out of. And often they think that there's good things in part because they blend what Ayn Rand would call proper human association with tribal association. So uh, if you type in uh, Alain Giorno and tribalism, look for his new ideal piece. I think that's a really good way to connect uh, these things to the world, but it's, it's a very rich and very unfortunately relevant topic. And even setting aside today's, the resurgence of it, um, I don't, I, it makes it way easier to understand the people you deal with when you can understand this kind of dynamic. Boy, Ayn Rand really called it, didn't she? We're living in the nightmare that this essay projected only in a cruder, less conceptual, more collectivistic, and a cruder collectivistic way with this sort of, uh, the way it's broken down now. You've got the way the right is and the way the left is. It's 
even more tribalistic and crudely tribalistic than it was 50 years ago when Ayn Rand was writing about this. Thank you very much um, for everything um, and for these last comments. So um, if you uh, or like these kind of discussions, feel free to support us. It helps us very much. Ayn Rand Center UK. Uh, there are several levels of memberships where you can help us, or, or you can also go with a super chat. Um, so I guess that's it. Uh, thank you very much, Don. Thank you very much, James, for this discussion. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thanks, guys.